Hey everybody, how you doing? Great. Welcome to South Lake if you don't live here. How many people are from out of the country? Oh, okay, great. How many people are from out of the state? Great. I got, I'm assuming the rest of you are from in the state. Um, um, thanks for that intro, Jill, and thank you for to our speakers who came here, uh, our, our, uh, the doctors, and also uh, Sam Harrell and uh, the Brion family. And we have other uh, we have other patients here that would be happy to talk to you about their experiences either at RMI or. Um, or in Panama. So I'm mostly going to talk about Panama and what we do there, and I'm going to let Dr. Herrera talk about what, what we do here at RMI um, for the most part. So um, first thing I want to show you a picture of Panama. This is the, this is the skyline of Panama. As uh, somebody said, it's not uh, three-legged dogs and dugout canoes anymore. So um, our clinic is actually in the tallest building on the left. Um, and um, we're on the 63rd floor of that, and um, it's it's beautiful beautiful view. We've been there for a couple of years now. We just sort of started really small and just evolved into larger and larger spaces. Um, so I'll start with uh, basically the history of Panama. We started there in 2007. Uh, we have um, a 15,000 square foot manufacturing facility. And it's in what's called the City of Knowledge. It used to be an army base. It used to be the United States Army base. And it's right across the street from the canal. And uh, we were accepted in there in 2007. We built a small lab out there. And now it's a 15,000 square foot manufacturing and research and development laboratory. And then our clinical space um, is in downtown Panama City in a high rise, which is depicted here. So I'd like to start with a story um, about uh, in 2010, I get a phone call from an actor, a uh, relatively well-known actor, and uh, he's a brave guy, he has a big heart. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, I guess there was a video of him earlier, so um, anyway, he calls me up and he says, uh, hey man, uh, I'm an actor, you probably heard of me, I'm th that guy you heard of. Uh, he says, my dad, my dad's in bad shape, he's got a bad hip. And uh, he went to the hospital to get the hip replacement, but he was in too bad a shape. He had a hip, re hip replacement on the left side, but his right hip's now bad. They want to give him a hip replacement, but the guy I'm in there found out he's in heart failure and he's in kidney failure, so they figure it's going to kill him to do the replacement. So he's like, I'm sure if he doesn't move around, he's going to die soon, and I'd like to see if there's anything we can do. So then I think... Perfect. A uh, celebrity's dad comes to Panama and drops dead in the clinic before he gets stem cells. <laughs> so he, um, he introduced me to his Mayo doctor, who's a family friend, and said, well, I want you to talk to this guy and explain it because I don't understand it. So uh, I got Dr. Paz, our medical director, on the phone, and we talked to this doctor, Dr. Brad Hildstrom. And um, he had a whole bunch of really good questions. We talked for about an hour and a half. And we um, sent him a lot, of, a lot of scientific papers because, frankly, most, most of the profession, particularly back then, didn't have any idea what an MSC, what mesenchymal stem cell was. So we sent him articles that would give him the rationale for why the cells might possibly benefit his heart and his kidneys and, and his hips. So uh, to his credit, he read all those articles and he was, he was loaded for bear the next time we talked. And um, ultimately, he said, you know, the actor asked him, do you mind, you, do you think I should bring my dad down there? And he said, well, I don't see why not. So he actually, Dr. Hillstrom came with the family and we treated him in his hip. We gave him, the only thing we use in Panama are umbilical cord, mesenchymal stem cells, and I'm gonna get into the weeds on that a little bit later, but we treated him in his hip. We also gave him IVs a month later. The actor calls me and says, my dad has no pain in his hip. And then two months later, he called me and said he's walking. So when he came to Panama, he was hunched over in a wheelchair and never got out of it unless somebody got him out of it. Three months later, he called me up and said he went and had his checkup at Mayo Clinic. He no longer has heart failure. He no longer has kidney failure. And his hip is in, in pretty good shape. So um, he's... And then fast forward to last June, and I get a call from this said actor, and he says, I just talked to the old man, I asked him what he wants for his 100th birthday. And he was 92 when he treated him the first time. And he said, all I want is go to Panama and get more stem cells. 
So he came to Panama, got more stem cells. All, all, all told, I think he's been there four times so far. So when he starts getting run down, they bring him down, give him more stem cells, just gets benefit. And um, this is a picture of uh, Hutton, Hutton Gibson at his 100th birthday party last August. So. And that story goes a long way to tell you how, sort of, you know, what all the capacity of the cells. And as Jill mentioned, there are a lot of things the cells can't do. But one thing they can do is recharge a system that's not, that, that where the batteries are very low. And I just want to briefly introduce our, our speakers. Dr. Herrera, after, I don't have these in the right order, but Dr. Diaz, I'm going to talk about Panama. A couple conditions that we treat in Panama. Dr. Diaz is going to talk about a couple other conditions in Panama and his personal experience. Dr. Herrera is going to talk, he's, he's a board certified um, pain specialist, 10 years experience. He is the medical director at RMI, which is our clinic around the corner here. He's going to talk about what we do. He's going to focus on spine, but we do do a lot of other joints. We, we do orthopedics and spine. Um, so he's a spine specialist, so he's going to focus on that. And then Dr. Roberta Shapiro, to me, uh, she's, she's, we've been working together for many, many years. She came to a talk. She flew all the way from New York out to Arizona. We were talking about spinal cord injury. And she flew out there, and we, I think we sat there and talked for two hours after everybody had cleared out. She's a kindred soul. She gets it. She understands it. She's kind of a doctor to the rich and famous not only in New York, but elsewhere, they come all over to, uh, from all over to her. And she routinely comes to Panama, brings her patients, oversees their care. And uh, she's, uh, she's affiliated with Columbia University, a uh, really smart gal, and I have no freaking idea what she's going to talk about. And she kind of gave me a clue earlier and scared me a little bit, but anyway. <laughs> So she's a big girl, we'll let her go. Um, then I'll, I'll kind of recap at the end and then we're gonna break out where you can talk to patients, you can talk to Dr. Diaz, or you can talk to myself, you can talk to Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Herrera. That's kind of how we're gonna go here. And I think Jill already covered, covered this. Thanks all for coming. She said, write down, please write down your questions. Because frankly, if, if we get a line going, we'll be here till late into the night. And if you can't stay, we'd like to accommodate everybody and answer your questions. And, but in being respectful for everybody's time, it would be great if you could fill out the question uh, on the blue sheet and then put it in the basket, and we will absolutely get back to everybody and, and answer your questions. And also, please feel free to mingle with these patients who have so graciously just, uh, have come here on their own time and are willing to talk about their stories because some of them are, are fantastic. So. so there are two major kind of stem cells in our body. We have the HSCs the hematopoietic stem cells. I promise not to use any word over three syllables except for mesenchymal, and I'm gonna use it one time. And the mesenchymal stem cell, we call them MSCs. So HSCs are the, they're predominantly reside in the bone marrow, and they're the cells that produce all of your, your white blood cells, your red blood cells, your platelets, and they're chronically renewing that. You know, your red blood cells are replaced roughly every three to four months. Your, some of your white cells are replaced every couple of days, so they're very important. So you, a lot of people hear about bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant. Um, th that refers to typically in cancer treatment when somebody gets chemotherapy and the idea is let's kill all those cancer cells with chemo and or radiation and unfortunately the collateral damage is the HSCs. So if you're going to get that massive amount of chemotherapy in the attempt to kill all the cancer cells, you wipe out the HSC. So you can either store some of your own HSCs in certain examples or you can get a bone marrow donation from somebody or you can get an umbilical cord blood donation which is the equivalent of bone marrow. It will restore the bone marrow. That, those, those are bone marrow transplants and, and they've, been, they've been successful. Mm, I mean, they've been able to save people's lives for a number of years. I, I don't know about the success in the cancer treatment, but so that, a lot of times people talk about that. That's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about another kind of stem cell that resides everywhere in your body. It's called the mesenchymal stem cell. And those are the cells that we're talking about today. And predominantly we're talking about those cells either from bone marrow or from after birth tissue, from live healthy births, no embryos are destroyed, no fetuses are destroyed. These are just from live healthy births. Those are the cells that we're talking about. So these cells are found everywhere in our bodies. On the left is a, is a, a picture 
of a capillary, which is a very small blood vessel, the smallest blood vessels we have in our bodies, and the pink cells around the capillary are MSCs. So they live where your blood vessels live. And the picture on the right is uh, basically a body that's been, the blood, the blood system's been rubberized and everything's been dissolved away except for the blood system. And you can see the anatomy of the human body. So it's just to de de depict that blood vessels are everywhere in our body. And just to give you an idea that what we're doing in Panama, what we're doing here is not, is a, it's not in a, we're not operating in a vacuum. There are, there are several hundred clinical trials going on right now globally. Um, and this is just a quick search on Medline, which is a, you know, a medical uh, database of the word mesenchymal and how many times it's used. And this is over the last 10 years. You can see it's just shot right up. So um, the, these are conditions that are on clinicaltrials.gov that are being currently studied. And we're studying some of these in Panama, but they're being studied globally. So the predominant effects of MSCs in the body are to repair things, right? So what does repair involve? Well, you have to control the immune system because a runaway immune system is going to basically destroy the repair process. You have to control inflammation because chronic inflammation is, is basically the, the devil for everything. And if you can't control the inflammation, you're just going to get sicker and sicker. And a, and a wound will not heal if it's chronically inflamed. And also, the cells ha have the ability to stimulate regeneration, as in, you know, Mr. Gibson's, uh, as an example. So these are sources of MSCs, and basically, I just showed you that they're in every tissue in the body, but the ones that are, have been studied most clinically are from bone marrow, from fat, and from umbilical cord. You can find them, you know, in amnion, placenta, teeth. Uh, we we have the I don't know, honor of uh, discovering the menstrual stem cells. Uh, I think it was in 2008. We did the work, started in 2006, but we discovered that. Um, we don't use it clinically, we, uh, but it is being used uh, for tumor therapy um, in, in clinical trials right now. So what is uh, the umbilical cord? Well, the coolest thing about the umbilical cord is, is that we know that from a live, healthy birth, those cells don't want to become anything because the baby's already become, if that makes sense. So if you take embryonic stem cells, they want to be a baby. You take fetal cells at an early enough stage, they still want to be a baby. So you don't know what you get. And we wrote an article years ago called The King is Dead, Long Live the King, where we talk about the, 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 basically the ending of embryonic stem cell research and how many resources were wasted. And you know the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, they raised $3 billion and they burned through $2.5 billion to go, oh, embryonic stem cells don't work. So now they're taking their, their last money and they're doing work on adult stem cells. So I'm only talking about adult stem cells here from live healthy births. Uh, we have a method of selecting um, the uh, cells that have a high degree of clinical effectiveness. Effectiveness, four syllables, sorry. Uh, clinical effectiveness, um, because we have such a big data pool from all of the subjects that have been treated, and Coach Sam Harrell being one. You know, as an example, Coach Sam came in 2010 for his MS and he got treated. I don't mean to steal his thunder. He's going to actually give an update. I saw he had a video, an old video there, and Danny's going to uh, give an update as well. But Coach Sam Harrell came in 2000, 2010 and he got some benefit, but it was not long lived. He came in 2011 and he got some benefit, but it was not long lived. He came down in 2012 and he got treatment and it was unbelievable. I mean, well, I'll let him tell his story, but I wanted to know well, what's different about 10, 11, and 12. Make, you know, as a, as a curious person, what is it that was different about 12? So we took 12 compared to 10 and 11 and many other cases like that, and we we're able to figure out what's different about those cells. So now we can look at the characteristics of the cells early on in our in our in our manufacturing and determine whether they're going to be good or not. So then we take all the ones that aren't going to be good and we throw them in the trash and we don't waste time and money and we don't have a, a crappy product. Um, that's, that's a scientific term. No. <laughs> so, 
so anyway, these, these cells are, you know, the, the mother is screened for, for high-risk behavior. The mother is tested for infectious disease. The actual cord is tested for infectious disease. The cells are selected. Then they're, you know, then they're grown in large number. And then they're, they're tested again for any potential infectious disease. Uh, and they're tested for endotoxin, something that causes a fever. And then they're quarantined until all those tests come back. And uh, then and only then are they used in people. So this will give you a, a bit of a timeline uh, of you know, sort of the high points of the last 12 years. We started in 2007. I have to take off my glasses. Um, we got that award in, uh, let me see, I've got a clicker here. All right, I'm not work that's not working, Jay, but it's all right. Anyway, we, we discovered the menstrual stem cell in 2006. We published that in 2008. We built our new, our new lab um, in Panama, which is the very large one, 15,000 square foot one. We built a new clinic in 2010. Uh, we did our first IND. We were, the, we were the first to treat a human being in the United States with umbilical cord MSCs, and that's Ryan Benton. If you've read the book, or if you're going to read the book, he basically is a start and a finish with Ryan Benton, who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and he's, we started treating him when he's 22, when he was 22, and now he's 33 and a bit, and he would argue that he's way healthier now than he was when he was 22. He was given a life, basically life expectancy about two and a half years at that point. Um, so then we started the, the Reardon Medical uh, Institute over here five years ago. Um, and then uh, we, got, we started our second IND. Now, these are compassionate use, single patient INDs. And IND is an investigational new drug application to the FDA. So these are done under FDA, uh, FDA guidance and, and, uh, and oversight. Then in 2016, we built our big new clinic up in, in Panama. It doesn't have it on here, but we did a complete rebuild. So our, our manufacturing and our laboratory is GMP. Then we started Signature Biologics, which is a company that we use a lot of the products here in, at, at RMI. These are afterbirth tissue products, which are exempt by FDA. So we, we do that, and we also, a lot of other physicians use those products as well. So, and, uh, you know, the future, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But, you know, we have, we have uh, clinical trials that we're, that we're just getting started with in the U.S. We plan on using the same uh, MSCs that we use in Panama in orphan conditions here in the United States. And the, the, the three targets are something called Lee syndrome, DMD, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and spinal muscular atrophy. So we're, we're actively working on those. We're also doing clinical trials with our, our afterbirth products, the umbilical cord tissue product, the amnion tissue product for osteoarthritis, di different uh, pain syndromes. So basically, in, in Panama, we, we have two companies. One's a clinic, one's a manufacturing. We have also a clinical trials company. It's not on here, but we have about 120 staff down there. And a, a, a lot of, I, I, I had about three of these questions before, you know, before I even came up here. And, and, and it's about, like, kind of what does treatment entail? Well, a typical treatment in Panama, people, you can just count on being there for roughly a week. So... A, a typical thing is people fly down on a, on a Sunday. We have, we have concierge service that picks you up at the gate. I mean, literally when you get off the plane, they take you through customs integration. You go to a VIP lounge if you're waiting on luggage. If you're not, you just go to your car. There's a car waiting for you, takes you to the hotel. The hel ho we're, our clinic, the building is attached to a Hilton and you get a key card that goes, and you don't need to leave the hotel and you just go into our elevator bank and you go up. So it's relatively, it's easy peasy. I mean. That, that compared to the old days, this is, this is a beautiful thing. So you don't even have to leave the building if you don't want to. And typically people are there for four, four to seven days, unless it's spinal cord injury, which is a much longer protocol. But for what we're talking about today, you're, you're basically there. Um, most protocols are only three or four days of actual treatment. The amount of time you're sitting in the clinic uh, after you've done your first day evaluation is maximum 30 minutes, so you have lots of free time for the pool, et cetera. Um, so I want to talk about how these cells work or potentially work. And the old paradigm was you inject these cells and they become something. And this, this really hung on for a long time. But I, it's, I think the final nail is in the coffin. These cells do not 
Go in your body and become something. You, you hear people talking about stem cells and will they make any tissue in the body, blah, blah, blah. They don't do it. You can do it in the lab. We can make them dance, make them sing. They can become, you know, pancreas. They can become uh, nerves. They can become car cartilage and ligaments and skin and, you know, kidney and heart. But when you inject them into a body, it doesn't have to be a human body, a mammalian body, they do not... They'll hang around, but they do not become anything else other than an MSC. And I'm going I'm to illustrate that. So they secrete things. You probably heard the word exosome, and my exosome kind of big buzzword now. They secrete these little packets that have, they have RNA and DNA and microvesicles, which are a bigger thing that they secrete. They can have mitochondria, and mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. And these cells can actually donate mitochondria to a sick cell. So they, and they triage sick cells and they say, oh, you're not going to make it. You get nothing. Or, hey, you're okay. You get nothing. Hey, you're going to make it. If I dump these mitochondria into you, maybe you're going to, you know, you got a shot. So that's how they work. Not by becoming anything, replacing tissue, replacing cells. They secrete stuff that stimulates repair and decreases inflammation. So here's, uh, this, this study was in 2008, and to me, I was done with the whole cell replacement hypothesis at this point. So they, take, they took rats, and they cut their spinal cords, and when you cut a spinal cord of a rat, it goes boink, and the boink, re, it gives you a one to two millimeter gap. And then in that gap, they put human umbilical MSCs in a, in a natural, in a, basically a biodegradable gel, and, and then this, oh, sorry, I got a picture here. Um, so they put, they put this gel in and around the cut ends of that cord, and what do they find? Uh, but the, the, the spinal cords regrew. And then they took those spinal cords out afterwards, and they sliced them up, and they were able to stain them for human versus mouse or rat. And, and the human cells stained, but none of them were part of the central nervous system. They were trapped in between nerve fibers, but they did not become anything. They did not become anything in those animals. All they did was they secreted stuff to stimulate the natural repair process. And just to di digress a little bit on spinal cord, so you know you can cut out you can cut out 80% of your liver and it will regrow. Well, it's highly vascularized. So they're, they're just millions, maybe billions, there are certainly billions, maybe trillions of blood vessels in your, in your liver, and each one of those blood vessels is covered by an MSC, and so if you cut it out, it has this tremendous repair capacity. So those cells uh, stimulate repair, and that liver can regrow itself. Well, the spinal cord is on the opposite end of that spectrum. There are very, there's just barely enough blood supply to keep our spinal cord going. So we built, evolutionarily, we built this magnificent cage around our spinal cord and our, and our, and our, and our brain that basically protects it. And, you know, if you think about it, if you're running from a tiger and the tiger gets you and breaks your spinal cord, uh, the likelihood of you surviving is pretty low. So let's not waste a lot of, you know, time and energy on putting blood vessels to repair that because you're done anyway. So the, the, the spinal cord has very, very few MSCs in it, so therefore, in response to injury, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty subdued, and you can have some regeneration, but it's very little. So all we do, you know, we take these cells from a young, healthy source, and we put them there, and we let them secrete stuff and do what they would naturally do if they were already there. It's just that the spinal cord is devoid of MSCs. It has very, very few of them. Another example of it's not the cells, but what the cells secrete is a parabiosis experiment that was done at Harvard. And what they did is they took old mice and young mice and they, they um, sewed them together and they sewed their bloodstreams together so they're sharing blood. And what happened is the old mice got way younger, you know, physiologically. Their hearts got better. They could think better. Their central nervous system path, you know, when you cut it up, it looked younger. The muscle, the heart muscle was younger. The skeletal muscle was younger. Everything was younger in the old, in the old mice. And there, was no, there were no cells implanted. They were just exposed to that young blood. And the secretions of the cells from the young mice stimulated repair in the old mice. <clears throat> um, this... This, is a, this slide can get depressing, except, especially if you're my age or older. Um, so, uh, you know, this kind of explains. So 
When you're 12 years old, you can fall off the roof, break your leg in three places, and you can splint it up, and in all likelihood, in six to eight weeks, it's gonna be, it's gonna be where you could walk on it, and in 12 weeks, you wouldn't even know that you ever had the fracture, right? When you're middle-aged and that happens, well, you got to go to the doctor and probably spend a lot of time in bed with pins and stuff to keep everything in the place so it can heal. And when you're in your eighth or ninth decade, you're lucky if it heals at all or if you survive the fall. Well, this kind of explains that. If you take newborn cells and you put them in culture, these are MSCs, you take newborn MSCs, you put them in culture, they divide about every 24 hours. So if you just do the math on that, at the end of a month, you've got a billion cells from a newborn. Well, a middle-aged person, they divide about every two days. So every 48 hours, you get a doubling. So now instead of having a billion cells at the end of a month, you have 32,000. And then at, at 65, you have a, a, a few thousand cells. So if you have a million cell problem and you're only making 30,000, you just basically have a math problem. And one of the things the young cells do is they stimulate your own cells to behave younger and to divide faster and to secrete more stuff. Another scientific term, stuff. So um, I'm going to try this, but it didn't work before. Uh, so I'm looking for, oh, I got it. I got it right here. So um, this, is, this is a... Uh, we, have, we have a research lab here in Texas as well, n near the laboratory where we make our, our, our cord products and our, our amnion products. And this is uh, a time lapse of uh, Dr. Hernandez, who couldn't make it today, but he's, he's a scientist. He, he actually worked for us in Panama for a number of years. And he got a full scholarship at University of Wisconsin. He went up there, did his PhD, and now I got him back. It took eight years, but I got him back. And he made this for me the other day. And basically, he took cells and he threw them in culture. <clears throat> and this is 16 hours and 16 seconds. And this is what happens. So just show you. Oh, nope. Back. Fail. OK. There you go. So these are the cells attaching. So these cells are anchors dependent. They require a substrate. They need to hang on to something or they don't grow. So. You can see them all laying down there and, and starting to divide. So that's 16 hours later. So that's the way we do everything now. But the next generation is, is three dimensions. Because these cells, frankly, in the body, they grow in three dimensions. They're not growing on a plate you know, and only touching out here. They're touching kind of everywhere. So we now are in the final phases of testing of three-dimensional uh, manufacturing, which allows the cells to be more in a natural state, number one. Number two, they're also, um, they're actually more STEMI, if, that, if that's the term. But they, they, because, the, uh, because they're able to interact, like here's, here are five of these beads. So these are little beads, and each bead can house about 500 cells. And so they, you can see them touching each other and communicating, and they're acting more like they would in culture. And the, 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 the other um, cool thing is it reduces cost. So once we go to this, our costs are going to come down because we have to use a lot less of the consumables that are required to make the cells. So we can't wait till this to happen because it's going to lower prices for everybody and, uh, and the cells actually behave better. So we're in the process of that. Just a quick shout out. This is what Dr. Herrera is going to talk about. Reardon. Medical Institute over here. You know, the main difference that I want to talk about what we can do in Panama, which you can't do here, is in Panama we can use cells that have been isolated. That's not legal in the United States right now. Um, and we can use cells that have been grown. That's not legal. In, other than under IND with FDA, that's not legal in the United States. So uh, what we do here is we use tissue that, that, you know, young, healthy tissue that can help influence your own bone marrow, but the stem cells in the bone marrow can be, you know, um, can help, help you to repair stuff. And Dr. Herrera only treats, um, you know, um, joint problems and spine problems and stuff like that. So that's the big difference. Once you take, for example, umbilical cord, so we take, we take an umbilical cord, um, 
we you know screen everything and we clean it very well and then we strip out the blood vessels and then we take the jelly which is holds the blood vessels in place and keeps the cord from kinking it's called Wharton's jelly we take that jelly we scrape it off from the outside of the cord and then we cut it in very fine pieces and then we put it in culture and we isolate the cells well once you isolate the cells you've gone beyond what FDA allows you to do in the US you cannot use isolated cells in the US um, and then, of course, we grow them, which you cannot do in the United States. So we only use tissue, and we use your bone marrow, which has stem cells. The bone marrow has MSCs. It also has the, the hematopoietic stem cells. It also has a cell that stimulates angiogenesis, or new blood vessel growth. So if you have a problem that needs new blood vessels growing, the bone marrow is very good for that. The, this is just a picture of somebody in the lab. This is Angelica, and she worked for us in Panama for years, and then she came up, she came up here and she runs our quality uh, in, our, in our manufacturing here. So I'm gonna talk only about two clinical studies here, and these studies were not done by us. Um, Dr. Diaz is gonna talk about studies that we've done, but these were done by other people, and these were done the gold standard way, and they're very large uh, populations that, and this one study was done on rheumatoid arthritis and the other one was done on type two diabetes. So if anybody's watched TV in the last, I don't know, day, you've seen an advert for one of these medications, I would think. These are called DMARDs, or disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And uh, there are other DMARDs, but these are the biologics. And the biologics are antibodies that they, they're, they're specific for two of the generals of the immune system. There's TNF and IL-6, and those, those guys are like, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. And for an immune system, if you have rheumatoid arthritis and you're saying let's go to your white blood cells and they're attacking your joints, well, it's no bueno, right? So the, these products, when you, when you infuse them IV and they have to be given IV, they attack or they bind up to those generals of the immune system and say, hey, calm down or actually take them out of duty. And, and so you can feel like a million bucks real quick because that's what they do. And, uh, <clears throat> and the problem is they don't stay around forever and they don't retrain the immune system. They don't, the, the root cause of the problem is the immune system's producing too much of this stuff. Well, they don't, they don't do that, these drugs, but they're really good drugs. And they're, they're the, the four of those are the top four selling drugs on the planet because they do work. So this study was done in 2013, um, and there were 172 people that received 40 million umbilical cord human umbilical cord MSCs IV. And what they did, this is a summary of the, patient, of the data, there were zero serious side effects, adverse events. All the patients improved, and, I, and I'd be happy to get you a copy of this paper. It's, it's too much to talk about, but this is a summary. The number one general of the immune system, TNF-alpha, decreased by 50%. And, um, and then they took a sub-cohort of them, and they treated them again of these subjects, and they treated them three months later, gave them another 40 million cells, and the TNF-alpha dropped by another 50%, so a total of 75%. And this, this, this suppression persisted for eight months. So for eight months afterwards, they didn't need any medications. And that, unfortunately, that's where they ended the study. But I can tell you, we have rheumatoid arthritis patients who are eight, 10 years out, and they don't need to be retreated. We have others that do need to be retreated, but we have many that they're one and done, at least for a period of time. And, and, and then this is um, showing you the, uh, so here's the, the IL-6. This is after a week. This is the control patients, this is the treated. This is after three months, and this is after eight months. You can see that it's still suppressed. And this is TNF-alpha. Um, this is after one week, three months, and six months after that. So um, we, have, we have one patient who's from the Dallas area. She's the, um, she's a, uh, the sister of, of a business partner of mine in another venture. And she had really severe um, rheumatoid arthritis, and she wanted to 
she was on these deme one of these deme disease modifying drugs and several other drugs, some 20 some odd medications. And she came down there, it's been about three and a half years ago, and her husband couldn't retire from work. Even though he was 72 years old, he couldn't retire because it was 100 grand a year for all the medications. So he wouldn't retire. So they came down to Panama, she got treated. And to this day, she doesn't take any medication. She was followed very closely with all of her rheum turf factor, her CRP, all of her inflammatory markers decreased. And to this day, she's fine. And it's, it's not, not everybody's like that, but a lot of them are. I wish, I mean, because we treat some conditions that are very difficult to treat. And if they were all RA, it would be fantastic. Just because most people get better so much uh, and rapidly. So um, this, this other study that, was, that was, it was published in 2016, this is on type 2 diabetes. And um, people probably heard of Syndrome X and um, you know, metabolic syndrome. We wrote a paper a number of years ago about how MSCs are depleted in people with Syndrome X and metabolic syndrome, which were both precursors to type 2 diabetes and how, how maybe giving given them the cells would help them. So. Um, this, they gave 60 million cells IV, but then they followed it thir it's four weeks later with tumor called the glioblastoma, glioma, and we established these big tumors in these poor rats' brains, and then we gave them a single intravenous infusion, or single intratumoral infusion of the cells, or we gave them three umbilical, uh, IV cells in their tail vein, and it didn't matter which way we gave the cells, the tumor shrank by 50%. And then these guys at K-State, I'm from Kansas, so... I think I know somebody else who went to K-State. But anyway, these guys at K-State did a really, they kind of emulated our study in that they used the same therapeutic, like one shot into the tumor or three shots IV, and they established this breast cancer. They put a bunch of cells into the groin, and it grows into a big tumor, and then that tumor metastasizes or goes around the rest of the body, and it kills the animals in short order. And so they did that, and then this is what happened. So that, that picture, this picture here, that's a, that's a control, so they didn't receive the cells. And then this one, they received the cells, so that's a primary tumor, and there's no primary tumor here and these are the survival curves so these are the untreated or the the sham treated animals and then these are the these are the this is the tumor volume of the treated animals one line is injected in the tumor the other was given three ivs and you can see that there's no tumor left and they followed them for 100 days and and so they hypothesized that these cells somehow either directly killed or induced the death of the cancer stem cell that is was promoting that that cancer so from a safety perspective we have now we published our ms paper there were no serious adverse events. We pu well, there, there were something called serious, which is like flu-like symptoms if you throw up. But out of, out, of, out of, you know, 100 patient days, somebody might get sick. So anyway, we had to report those to, to uh, flu-like symptoms. Um, and, and then on our autism trial, we had zero serious adverse events. Um, so anyway, I'm comfortable with the safety, and, um, and, and we'd be happy to provide you other information on safety. But um, I want to talk about, just for a minute, about the proliferation of stem cell clinics in the United States. And uh, are you going to talk about this? Oh, Dr. Shapiro is going to talk about it. But so I think my, my main point here is I already explained FDA's position on 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 cells and what you can use and what you can't use. Well, there's no good reason, there's no legal reason, there's no legal rationale to give anybody IV stem cells in the United States, period. And if you're doing it, 
It's against the law. I mean, don't you think I would be doing it if it were legal? I would absolutely be doing it, but it's not legal. Um, I'm an expert witness on a case in Arizona where they gave a gentleman cells and put him in the ICU for six weeks. Now he needs a shoulder replacement. His life will never be the same. Um, so anyway, and we've tested a multitude of products that purport to have a lot of cells in them. I'm going to show you a picture here. This is one, our product on the left that shows the viability of the tissue. Um, and this is a competitor's product, literally that's labeled 1.1 million stem cells in it. We found five, but they weren't stem cells, but we found five cells. So I just warn you that when somebody is telling you they're given IV stem cells in the United States, it's either they're not or it's illegal. We tested another product out of Houston that says it has 10 million cells in it. There were zero MSCs in it. MSCs do not occur in blood. So if somebody says, I'm going to give you stem cells from umbilical cord blood, they're not. Simple as that. I don't want to be negative, particularly since I'm closing, but it is a big topic that I get asked about a lot. And, uh, and here's, here's two of the five stem cells on the right, or cells that we found on the right. So in closing, uh, I'd like to talk about where we're going next. I alluded to these orphan conditions that we're going after in the U.S. Um, we're in the CRO process there of actually doing something there uh, with orphan conditions. Uh, we're doing clinical trials with our, um, our afterbirth product, tissue, pro tissue products. Um, and, and, you know, we passed a bill here in Texas called House Bill 810, Charlie's Law, and we were all set to go meet with uh, the head of the FDA. And, you know, politics in this country right now are a bit divisive, and, and that opportunity was lost before um, our past FDA commissioner who had agreed to meet quit. And uh, so until there's detente, I don't think you're going to see any widespread use of that. Think of the marijuana dispensaries in California early on when California said it's okay to use that. That's the equivalent here. We have the state of Texas saying adult stem cells should be available to people with chronic, se severe chronic diseases and terminal illnesses. And we don't care, you know, they care what the FDA says, but this is our state law and we're, you know, it's a state's rights issue. The problem is FDA could walk in anytime and basically destroy your lab and your clinic and I don't want to be that guy. So we're waiting to see if there's some detente. We're going to answer questions at the end. Sorry. Your slide, the last slide, didn't quantify how many uh, cells you had versus the five. Yeah. Oh, well, we don't talk about cells. We talk about tissue. And, 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 and I, I have entire, if you go out there to that booth, they have entire information about what's in the tissue, what the growth factors are, hyaluronic acid, all the stuff that's in there. Um, so then we have the federal right to try law, which I think probably will be the biggest, the first crack in the door where if you have a terminal illness, if, if a cell product of any product has phase one approval, they're going to be able to use it. It's just going to take a brave company to step up and do it. I don't know exactly when that's going to happen, but I think, I think it's imminent. Um, and uh, so other than that, I, I think I, I predict in 10 years we're going to be using these cells and the cell products for a, a wide array of conditions where it makes sense. Inflammatory, autoimmune diseases, failure to thrive, frailty of aging. Um, anyway, uh, think conditions that need, need an oomph for, for, um, for regeneration. I think we're going to see it in 10 years or less. Um, so in conclusion, I think that, you know, we've had, we've had some really big quantum leaps in medicine. We had vaccines. They've saved hundreds of millions of people. We've had antibiotics, which now the other side of the sword has come, and now they're bad, but they've saved countless lives. Surgery and anesthesia have reduced suffering dramatically, and I think the next revolution is regenerative cell therapy. And uh, I appreciate all you guys coming to hear more about it. Thank you very much.